So why are we even talking about this uh, period of the Enlightenment? Um, it's because nowadays talking about truth and reason is being belittled or even viewed as suspicious. The world around us is chaotic and complex, especially when you don't have the clear method of Marxism to analyze it. And moreover, all the institutions, the scientists, media and politicians of the ruling class that claim to the, the truth for themselves are so obviously lying that everyone can see this. Uh, they fail to give answers to pressing issues such as climate change, war and inequality, and only offer lies, corruption, scandals and incompetence. These are all symptoms of the decay of capitalism, and with it comes a mood of skepticism and doubt. This skepticism has found an ideological expression in postmodernist philosophy and other petty bourgeois ideologies. They openly deny that there even is such a thing as truth, objective reality, and laws that can be discovered. And with this, they also openly attack the Age of Enlightenment. They see uh, it as an outdated period where humanity naively believed in progress and truth. But in human history, the fight for truth and reason was an immensely progressive driving force for development. And actually, the rediscovery of a truth that does not come, come from the Bible, the rediscovery of materialism, of reason and of science, was not long ago at all. It was precisely uh, the age of the Enlightenment, a period, a period that, that roughly spans from the 17th to the 19th century. And in this period, we saw a sheer explosion of development and progress in all spheres of life. The great thinkers of the time fought for new ideas, clearing the way for a rational understanding of the world. They wanted to show that there are laws to be discovered in all aspects of life. And the struggle for truth was, was also a philosophical struggle. It was a battle of ideas that coincided with the rise of capitalism. Just like today, it was a time where the old feudal society was dying and a new society was struggling to be born. And just like today, the battle of ideas, the battle for truth and a rational understanding of the world was part of the struggle. And, and the Marxist understanding of the world has a history and it rests on the shoulder of giants. Uh, we must defend this heritage, which is our heritage. To defend our ideological heritage and the learn, to learn the lessons from it is, is just as important as studying the history of revolutions and class struggles. Now, in the 16th century, the old feudal order was starting to enter into a long crisis of rising contradictions. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels describe uh, this ascent of the new capitalist class, the bourgeoisie. They write in the Communist Manifesto the following. The discovery of America in, in 1492, the rounding of the Cape, open up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie. The East Indian and the Chinese markets, the colonization of America, trade with the colonies, the increase in the means of exchange and in commodities in generally, generally, gave to commerce, to navigation, to industry and impulse never no before known, and thereby to the revolutionary element in the tottering feudal society, a rapid development. So uh, that's, where the, that's where the quote ends. And, and, and this was the basis on which the intellectual life, philosophy and arts also awoke after the long slumber that had been the Middle Ages. This awakening was not like rising from a comfortable soft mattress. Even in the 17th century, the world was still a very fearful place in the eyes of most people. To them, the world was full of evil demons, the devil and spirits that threatened their poor souls. And the authority of the church ruled with an iron fist over the minds and bodies of the people. The church not only instilled this fear, it profited of it and pursued anyone who questions, questioned their authority with extreme brutality. The authority of the church rested on a top-down hierarchy. And the only truth that was accepted, accepted was the word of God. And the interpretation of the Bible was in the hands of priests and theologists. Common punish, punishments for dissidents were excommunication from church, incarceration, or even burning at the stake. There were frequent raids of bookshops. Authors, as well as publishers of critical writings were persecuted and critical books were frequently burned in public. For example, when the mat mathematician and physicist Giordano Bruno published his views, defending the Copernican heliocentric universe, that is that the sun and not the earth is the center of the universe, he was tried by the Roman Inquisition and burned at the stake in 1600. So just as today, no one is allowed to question the holy ideals of bourgeois democracy and private property, it was seen as a big crime to question the ideological pillars of the ruling order. 
It was a dangerous task to publicly defend new ideas, but there were courageous thinkers who did just that. Uh, this was the setting for the human mind breaking free and starting a battle against the old forces, also in the sphere of ideas. An important step was taken by the English materialists, and the most famous ones are Francis Bacon, Thomas Hobbes, and John Locke. Francis Bacon lived just before the English Revolution. He died in 1624. Bacon had a deep hatred for the theological scholastics of the Middle Ages that had dominated philosophy for centuries. In his view, the, the way science was done was completely wrong. He literally wrote, and I quote, the present method of experiment is blind and stupid. He complained that instead of looking at the real world, of conducting patient and thorough experiments and, and studying nature, they were just leading endless debates about abstract terms. In his view, it was necessary to, to go back to the basics, throw out all abstract theological concepts and start with facts, observations, and empirical data. Bacon was still a religious man, but he pushed God and religion aside because he thought that nature itself works according to laws that can be discovered through thorough experiment. In this way, the materialists of the Enlightenment revived the materialism of the old Greek philosophers. Now, another English materialist, Thomas Hobbes, uh, lived a little after Bacon. He lived right in the middle of the stormy period of the English Revolution of 1642 to 1649. Hobbes systematized the ideas of Bacon, giving them a more stringent but also a more rigid form. Uh, Hobbes also believed in God, but to him, once God had created nature and its laws, he didn't interfere with these laws anymore, which is called deism. On the contrary to Hobbes, only evil men constantly talk of wonders and witchcraft in order to scare people, when actually the laws of nature are perfectly fine to explain the workings of the world. In effect, theology and science were sharply separated. And thus, the way was cleared from religious rubble to look at the world through the eyes of reason. For Hobbes, everything, including ideas, are matter, and more precisely matter that moves. He writes, uh, when a body is once in motion, it moveth unless someone el something else hinder it eternally. So to him, not only bodies, but also the mind and ideas are a material thing that move. He explained that material objects move against our senses, so they impress in themselves onto our eyes and ears and so on. And then our body or our heart, as he says, exerts a counter pressure to these objects. And this friction creates sensation. Ideas to him are remnants of these sensations. It's like when you pluck the string of a violin and then the string continues to move and to vibrate in our brain kind of. So these vibrations to him are, are ideas. And with ongoing experience, we learn to add up these many sense impressions and simple ideas and can create uh, concepts. So what Hobbes presents here is a materialist explanation of ideas and the human mind. Things that were previously explained by God-given intuition and the soul. Everything to him is a chain of cause and effect. And all causes can be found and explained materially. Uh, we can see how the new mechanical sciences of the day exerted a big influence on Hobbes and other philosophers of the time. They had a very strong focus on the quantitative side of things. To them, movement consists basically of fixed, unchanging objects crashing into each other. So even though they were materialists, they had a very passive and mechanical understanding of movement. Something had to get objects to move, and then they would just continue to bump into other objects and so on ad infinitum. So this was the age of mechanics. Isaac Newton, for example, published his principles in, in 1687. Clearly, the sort of experiments and observations they conducted at the time were mostly mechanical observations. They didn't yet penetrate deep into in, inside uh, certain phenomena, inside cells and things like that. And the, the measures and numbers they operated with were quantitative data, mass, length, movement from A to B, and so on. The only change Hobbes and also other mechanical materialists acknowledged was quantitative change, that is, adding and subtracting numbers. To Hobbes, reason itself is only a mathematical operation. He writes, wherever there is place for addition and subtraction, subtraction, there is also place for reason. And where these have no place, there reason has nothing at all to do. So the thorough and clear materialist approach was an important step forward in philosophy. But it was also a one-sided side ex exaggeration. First of all, uh, this way of viewing things still left some room for God. 
uh, God was seen as the one who set things in motion in the first place. He was like the, the first cause or the first mover. But also with this purely quantitative concept of change, how can you explain the emergence of qualitatively new things? What they present is like playing with Lego. You put pieces together, but in the end, you will still only have a pile of Lego. Out of adding Lego together, you can create an animal or a living thing. In short, this quantitative mechanical form of materialism cannot explain that there are leaps where quantity changes into quality, quality which is something that Marxists do understand. For this, it was necessary to also look at the qualitative side of movement and to gain a deeper understanding of how things develop. This means you need a dialectical understanding of movement and development. So this task of developing the dialectics was taken up and studied in depth by other uh, actually idealist philosophers, especially in the Netherlands and Germany. Now, roughly at the same time as Hobbes, in the Netherlands, another bomb shook society. In 1637, the philosopher René Descartes published his famous Discourse, Discourse on the Method. Descartes de uh, demanded that everything in the world, including the Holy Bible, should be judged by reason. He had a profound impact on a strand of philosophy in continental Europe that spans from Spinoza to Leibniz to Kant and ultimately led to the dialectics of Hegel. Uh, the mechanical approach of the English materialists was at a crossroad. They had developed the objective side but put movement of matter in the mechanical and quantitative terms. It was now these idealist philosophers who took a closer look at, look at the qualitative and additive side of things. They, they wanted to look at, how, uh, at the big picture, uh, big picture, the big principles of how things are and how they change. Uh, the German philosopher Leibniz, who was born in 1647, put the question like this. To him, the world was made up of things he called monads. They can be understood as sort of elementary substances similar to atoms. He said, uh, and I quote, there must be simple substances since there are compounds. For a compound is nothing but a collection or aggregatum of simple things. So he says, yes, the quant quantitatively adding things up, compounding them, is one important aspect of development. But then he adds, yet the monads must have some quality, otherwise they would not even be existing things. And then he says, uh, and if simple substances did not differ in quality, there would be absolutely no means of perceiving any change in things. So what he's saying here is that if you just add more quantities of the same substance, all you get, all you will get is just more of the same. It's like adding more water to water. This does, this does not explain how all the qualitatively different things in the world can develop. So to Leibniz, not only quantitative differences, but also qualitative differences are necessary. Uh, his solution to, the, to this problem was to give his monads uh, infinitely many qualities. Uh, the, these qualities are like hidden within the monads as a potential or a germ not yet fully developed. His monads are constantly moving and changing. And when they interact with, with, with each other, they bring out or develop certain size and qualities. Qualities that are uh, at first only a potential or predisposition are thus developed. Now, Leibniz does not, uh, does not yet have the profundity of Hegel in explaining the dialectics between quantity uh, changing onto quality and vice versa. But he still gave a valuable contribution on this question. But one of the most interesting figures of this strand of philosophy is certainly Baruch de Spinoza. Spinoza was born in 1632, so he was about 15 years older than Leibniz. Actually, they met, even met once personally. Uh, Spinoza came from a Jewish family that had fled from uh, Portugal to the ne Netherlands. At the age of 24, in 1656, he decided to break decisively with his current life and to dedicate himself to philosophy. He provoked an excommunication from his Jewish community and moved away from Amsterdam. Throughout his life, he, he got offered sponsorship and professorships by different patrons and they tried to convince him to give up his provocative ideas. But he refused everything but the bare minimum, earning his living by polishing and cutting optical lenses. He was an open defender of free speech, of religious freedom, and he was an open Republican and against monarchy. Even 150 years after his death, Spinozism was still basically used synonymously with atheism. Spinoza himself refused the label of atheism, but his philosophy, in effect, leaves no space for religion or God in the common sense of the world. To him, there is only one substance in the world. He called it God, but it was not like any religious God. 
By God, he meant everything that exists in the real world. It is basically all of nature. For Spinoza, there is no separate spiritual realm besides this one substance. This substance or God is infinite and it doesn't have a beginning or end, but only knows constant change. Uh, to the mechanical materialist Hobbes, anything that didn't have clear limits, a beginning and an end, just meant that we didn't understand it. To speak of infinity to Hobbes was a sign of weakness. But Spinoza recognized that if you assume that the world was just created out of nowhere by God, um, without any logical cause, this is actually in, an inconsistent and a weakness in your argumentation. So for Spinoza, the one substance has always existed and will always exist and will only change its many different forms. The substance or nature has clear laws that can be understood. Ideas and matter to him are only two sides of the same one substance. And since ideas are part of this nature, ideas can also understand this nature. So clear ideas to him mean a clear understanding of the laws that govern us. So we can be uh, free if we understand the laws. And all laws in nature can be uncovered and understood. This is an important contribution to understand the connection between matter and idea and to understand uh, also change. So even though Spinoza, uh, Leibniz and also Hegel were idealists, they're, not, they're nothing like today's subjective idealists. They had a keen interest in natural sciences and they themselves did many experiments actually. They wanted to truly understand the world. Um, thus this, the school of th thought paved the way for the dialectical approach. How do things progress? What are the laws of movement? How does human thought itself develop? And this dialectical view was a necessary component for Marxism. It gave the key to overcoming the mechanical approach of the English materialists. So we are now entering the 18th century and the most interesting place at that time was France. The crisis of the old absolutist and feudal order had increased. In France, the backlash of the Catholic Church after the Reformation had been particularly strong. The church exercised vicious censorship and lorded over the lives of people. The, the absolute monarchy was a corrupt and parasitic monster that leached on society while the poor peasants lived in misery. For example, uh, King Louis XV owned 3,000 horses, 217 carriages, and had 30 personal doctors. In 1751, his household alone spent almost a quarter of the annual government income. Figures like these remind us of certain billionaires of today who spend fantastic amounts on private yachts or personal trips into space. A striking document of the mood of that time is the testament of a parish priest, uh, and uh, he was called Jean Meslier from the province of Champagne. And when Jean Meslier died in 1733, he left a testament to his small congregation. It was a burning manifesto against the church and against Jesus Christ, and it was in favor of atheism and a utopian version of communism. Meslier described Jesus Christ, and I quote, as a fanatic a misanthrope that speaks to the wretched and preaches them to be poor, to fight nature and to hate pleasure. And the, the Christian God, he said, was more evil than the evilest human. And he rejected all religion in favor of materialism. Meslier writes, I tell you that matter acts on its own account. Leave the first cause to the theologists. Nature doesn't need it to produce all the effects that you can witness. As you can see in, in, uh, from this quote, in the question of the first cause, he even went further than Hobbes and other, others uh, to open an atheism. Actually, this testament was so radical that Voltaire didn't dare to publish all of it uh, even 30 years later. He only uh, published excerpts. So the, the conditions in France really ripened for the old order to be overthrown. A private dinners and in the salons, a revolution was already a hot topic of discussion. Uh, the 18th century was the age of the French philosopher, the philosophers as they called themselves. So names such as Helvetius, Holbach, Diderot and Rousseau, uh, these were the thinkers that uh, inspired the French Revolution of 1789. Now in the English Revolution, not even a hundred years earlier, the different classes had still fought their battles in the guise of religion. All classes had fought in the name of God and their respective interpretation of God's will. The English materialist philosophers um, at that time had been revolutionaries in the sphere of human thought, but their ideas were no political weapons in the class battle of the English bourgeois revolution. On the contrary, the English materialist Thomas Hobbes had even been in favor of absolute monarchy. 
Yeah, but, but not in France. The, the church and the king were hated figures. And the French philosophers drank up the new ideas and focused them directly on society itself. The French philosophers were known figures. They were always in some trouble with the authorities. Many of them constantly moved around, fleeing from one government to the other. Their writings were frequently forbidden and publicly burned. But actually, that made them uh, just more attractive to the readers that tried to, tried to get their hands on the books. So books were wiggled past censorship, smuggled into the country from Germany or the Netherlands, and often written in pseudonyms. And the French philosophers of the 18th century, they really had a mission. Not only nature and not only human thought should bend to reason, but society itself must be understood rationally, and most of all, society should be modeled after reason. The ideas of the English empiricists, uh, Thomas Hobbes and, and John Locke, were immensely popular with these philosophers. To them, man is a machine, a machine that can be logically explained in a materialist way. So in, the, in their essays, uh, they, they imagined what humans would be outside of society in a natural primal state. Here, uh, every human machine is gifted with more or less the same abilities. Right? But if all humans are more or less the same, why was there so much inequality in society? And why was society so morally rotten? And they, they argued that as machines, we only follow our needs and what benef benefits us, us most. There is no absolute God given good or evil. They concluded that it must be the laws and the education of society itself that are evil. That these laws are so irrational that they make humans act unreasonable, greedy, and, and, and harm each other. Now, for Hobbes, the natural state of humans was one of constant fear of others taking away your property. In fact, he's supposed to have said, uh, when my mother gave birth, she gave birth to twins, me and fear. The French philosophers, on the other hand, had mostly an extremely positive, even idyllic and idealistic image of the natural state of humans. Bad laws and evil kings corrupted the natural goodness in humans. Therefore, the laws and the education must change for the true nature of humans to blossom. So in this way, they directed the new philosophical ideas towards society. However, the mechanical and ahistorical approach is, is still clearly visible in their writings. They didn't look at society as a historical progress. Instead, they always assumed society to be sort of a tabula rasa, an empty canvas that was the natural state that could be then modeled at will with rational good ideas and laws. Uh, this philosophy was very suitable actually for the ascending capitalist class because uh, capitalists don't plan production and society. They act somewhat like the machines that the materialists described. Get profit, invest money, get more profit. If the legal framework and the government don't permit you to do that, just change the constitution and change the government. But the more fundamental laws of society that the capitalists themselves follow unconsciously are a mystery to them. And they don't need to know them in order to make profits. And so the philosophers' battle cries of liberty, equality, and reason became political weapons for the bourgeois revolution. The French Revolution of 1789 and the years after cleared away the biggest obstacle of that time, the feudal order with the absolute monarchy and the rule of the church. And this actually allowed capitalism to develop faster. The class contradictions between the capitalists and the proletariat that were only embryonic before became more pronounced after the bourgeois revolutions. The French philosophers of the 18th century had imagined that society could be built after rational ideas. But after the bourgeois revolution, it became clear that they had been wrong. Not the education or the laws were the driving force of history. But as Marx and Engels uh, explained later, the development of the productive forces and class struggle are the driving force. Some thinkers like Rousseau or early utopian communists like Morelli and Mably had already guessed that the root problem had something to do with private property. But they didn't yet see why private property developed in history. So they wanted to battle the evil of private property with better education. They thought if only humans were taught not to believe in private property, the evil would disappear. As Marxists, we understand that the development of the productive forces is, is the reason why pro private property emerged, uh, which is also uh, uh, why classes and class struggle emerged. All class societies up until capitalism had not yet developed the productive forces enough to abolish private property. If a society cannot produce enough for everyone, if it's still a society of scarcity, then the conditions are not yet ripe to abolish, pr to abolish private property. 
Also, the French philosophers and the utopian communists at the time didn't have the working class as a revolutionary subject to work with. That is why the utopian French communist Mabli in the 18th century wrote the following about private property and I quote, all evil can be traced back to this perfidious element, the wish to own property. But then he says, today, no human force is in the position to restore equality. To them, the early proletarians that existed at the time were only poor lumpens. They were not yet a powerful force to change society. The power of the proletariat was not yet developed. Which is why Mabli, just like the later French utopian socialists, suggested the idealistic solution of educating humans to give up private property. It was Marxism that discovered the true laws of society and history. Marxism finally gives an explanation for how nature, human thought, and also society itself develop historically. Marxism explains that private property must be expropriated in a revolution and can't be educated away. We have here outlined some important key elements that were necessary for the emergence of Marxism. First, the materialist philosophy resurrected by the English and French materialists. And secondly, dialectics, that is the laws of change and development discovered by the idealist philosophers and especially Hegel. Uh, we say that ideas can change the world and, and that is true. But this only works if the ideas consciously grasp the laws and nature, uh, the laws of nature and society. And why Marxism was able to find these laws that govern nature, thought, and society, um, it was the result of the progress of the Enlightenment period. Marxism allows us to use philosophy uh, directly to change the world. It becomes a conscious weapon. With this, philosophy as it was in the past ends. Engels explained that the essential task of philosophy was to find the laws of development. And these laws then have to be applied to the world in practice, in science, as well as in class struggle. Marxism understands how capitalism works. But of course, this understanding leads directly to the conclusion that capitalism has outlived its, uh, its progressive phase. Just like the feudal order had to be overthrown to clear the way for, for, for the further development of society, it is now capitalism that has to be uh, overthrown. A true, rash, truly rational insight into the world leaves no other option, actually. That is exactly why today's ruling class rejects reason and truth. Today's ruling class throws away these valuable lessons of history because to take up this heritage and to continue on its road inevitably leads to arguing for their own downfall. But Marxism is the true heir of these courageous and revolutionary thinkers. Our task is to defend our heritage in the battle of ideas and to use our ideas consciously to change the world. That is, to fight for a society without exploitation and for socialism. Thank you. That was an excellent lead off by Yola, and I certainly learned a lot. Now we will open it up to uh, discussion. First up, we will have Hamid Elizadeh from the International Secretariat. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yola, for that uh, fantastic and uh, very wide ranging uh, lead off. And I think that uh, you're absolutely right that uh, these brave uh, fighters, revolutionaries, form a part of our heritage, at least their ideas do. Now, comrades, uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant once came up with a model for the Enlightenment, which, which he formulated uh, as dare to know. And he went on to say, the officer says, don't argue, drill. The tax collector says, don't argue, pay. The pastor says, don't argue, believe. You see, the thinkers of the Enlightenment had the courage, in the words of Descartes, to doubt everything, to doubt all established beliefs, and to demand a rational explanation for them. And here we see the crucial role of the philosophical struggle, the struggle for ideas in every revolution. And, and this was, in fact, uh, like the hours today, a time of, of extreme turbulence, of wars, civil wars, revolutions, and counter-revolutions. You had the rise of absolutism, the spiritual dictatorship of the church, religious wars, which killed millions of people. Tens of thousands were killed in witch trials. And scientists like Galileo were persecuted by the church inquisitors. And some of them, like Giordano Bruno, was burned at the stake. But this was also a, a, an age of rebellion and revolution. You had the Dutch Revolution, the Dutch bourgeois revolution. Then you had the English Revolution and Civil War in the 1640s. 
the bourgeoisie was gaining strength everywhere. And this also stimulated a, a revolution in science. And every step forward for science in turn proved, uh, disproved, sorry, the dogmas of the church and ushered in a revolution in philosophy, which in turn played a key role in propelling the bourgeois revolution. And one of the examples of this, one of the many remarkable people of this era, as Yola explained, was Spinoza. And as she explained, while, while Spino Spinoza did speak of God, but his God was no real God at all. His God was just simply nature, which acts Life according to his, to his own laws and without any supernatural involvement. And these laws, according to Sp Spinoza, can, can only be understood not via faith, not via prayers, not via preachers, but by the means of the scientific method, by, by means of observation, experimentation, and rational thinking. You can see how these ideas were, uh, how do you say, developed at the basis of uh, or along with the scientific revolution. In many ways, in fact, it was a form of materialism dressed in the uh, language of, of idealism and, and religion. And on this basis, he launched a merciless criticism of official religion. He explained that, that superstition only arises when human beings cannot understand the laws of nature and the reasons behind their own misery and oppression. And he said that those in power use this superstition in order to control the masses. But in order for this lie to have the highest effect, they, they dress up this superstition in all sorts of spectacular pomp and ceremony, in opulent buildings and dresses and ceremonies and traditions. And here's what he writes. It may indeed be the highest secret of monarchical government and utterly essential to it to keep men deceived and to disguise the fear that sways them with the specious name of religion so that they will fight for their servitude as if they were fighting for their own deliverance. And they will not think it humiliating, but supremely glorious to spill their blood and sacrifice their lives for the glorification of a single man. Now, this philosophy was an open declaration of war against the monarchies and organized religions of Europe. He went through the Bible and the Torah methodically and highlighted all of their contradictions. When it came to the prophets, he said that they did not have more perfect minds than others, but only a more vivid power of imagination. And therefore, those who look in the books of the prophets for wisdom and knowledge, uh, uh, and, and a knowledge of natural and spiritual things, are completely on the right, on the wrong track. Sorry, this is his words. He also said that miracles are just natural phenomena that people didn't understand. The miracles in the Bibles. So he said that a storm back then was called a rebuke from God and thunder and lightning, the arrows of God. He says, in this sense, therefore, the psalmist calls the miracles of Egypt powers of God because they opened the path to safety for the Hebrews in their extreme danger when they were not expecting any exit to appear. And so they were totally amazed. Essentially, this was not a miracle. It's just a... A gust of wind that they didn't realize was coming. Now, this is dynamite in the 1670s. And these ideas spread like wildfire. They were taken up by radical Christian sects, scientists, a atheistic uh, revolutionary trends. And, and Spinoza was immediately feared by, 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 uh, by the ruling classes in Europe. In the end, Spinoza, in fact, concludes that the only thing there is to learn from the Bible and the Torah sorry, that there's nothing to learn from the Bible and the Torah, except for moral values and social norms. And even those norms, he says, were only applicable to the historical conditions at the time, with the exception of one or two. Now, the truth, in other words, he says, does not come from scripture or the church, but from the study of nature. And from this, he went on to argue that the clergy should be stripped off all of its official powers. Separated, separated from the state, that freedom of speech and thought should be a universal right as a condition for a better society, and that therefore a republic was far more preferable than a monarchy. For the time, this, these were very advanced ideas, and they show the revolutionary spirit of the men of the Enlightenment. 
This is the spirit that academics today sneer at. But these were giants who played a key role in, in, the, in the bourgeois revolution. Their clarity and, and courage is a world of difference to the gibberish that is that so-called philosophy in universities called today. And for us, they form a part of our heritage, the kernel of which we, we need to defend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamid. If you're interested in learning more about philosophy, then I would urge you to get a copy of The History of Philosophy, A Marxist Perspective by Alan Woods. This brilliant book charts the overall development of philosophy from the animism of primitive humans through to its pinnacle in the thought of Marx and Engels. You can and should buy a copy today at wellread-books.com. I'll now bring in Ben Curry from Britain into the discussion. Hello, comrades. So um, as Yola explained, there's, uh, there's two trends in Enlightenment thinking. There were the imperial imperialists, sorry. There were the empiricists who believed that uh, we know the world purely through our senses. And their motto was, there is nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses. And opposed to them was the school of rationalism, which began with Descartes, as, you, as Yola explained. And they placed emphasis instead on reason rather than pure sensation as the source of knowledge. And both contained an element of truth, but both were one-sided in their theories, but both made important contributions to philosophy. But just as the capitalist class today represents an, an outworn system, so the modern so-called philosophers in the university campuses cling to the weakest sides of these great schools of philosophy. And I want to say a word or two about the modern descendants of empiricism in particular, represented today by positivism. The early empiricists, particularly Bacon, Hobbes and Locke, were by and large materialist thinkers. They believed that all knowledge comes from the senses, but our senses are, for them, a window onto an objective material world. But those that came later um, took the one-sided emphasis on experience and took it to an absurd con conclusion. Hume and Bishop Berkeley in the 18th century treated the senses like a wall beyond which we can never see. They concluded, if all we have are our senses to know the world, how can we even know that they tell us anything about a material world that exists out there independently of us? They ended up mired in skepticism. And Hume and Berkeley denied that we can know anything exists besides our own thoughts and sensations. We have our sensations and we can't know of anything else. And in the form of positivism, these ideas continue to hold sway, especially in the sciences today. In the 19th century, a physicist named Ernst Mach rehashed these ideas with a new name. He called his philosophy empiriocriticism, you may have heard of it. And for Mach and for the positivists of the early 20th century Vienna School, whom he was, he directly inspired this school. All we can say that exists are our sensations. So when I see an apple as a materialist, I understand that an apple is a material thing with an existence independent of the impressions it leaves on my senses. But for Mac, all I can say is I have certain sensations and these sensations just happen to correlate with one another. I see red, I see a round form and I taste something sweet and crunchy. And I call this correlated complex of sensations an apple but if I want to speak of a material apple that exists independently of my sensations, well, if I made that claim, the positivists would accuse me of being a meta of, of, of metaphysics. Well, un unfortunately, I'm recovering my sense of uh, taste and smell after a bout of COVID. So sadly, at the moment, apples no longer taste quite as sweet for me. So perhaps the whole of science should reassess exactly what an apple is because of that. Of course, I'm, I'm joking, but this is the absurd conclusion you arrive at if you take sensations and not the objective world as the object of science. And for the positivist, the goal of science isn't to say something about a material world, but to, to describe the patterns of our sensations. It's pure subjectivism. And these are not fringe ideas. This is what Stephen Hawking has to say. If one takes the positivist position as I do, one cannot say what time actually is. All one can do is describe what has been found to be a very good mathematical model. So for, for Hawking, we cannot say that time is an objective feature of nature. Now, these ideas have attained a massive reach, and they even found an echo amongst the Bolsheviks after the defeat of the 1905 revolution. Sorry. 
only on the basis of a theoretical struggle was Lenin able to drive these out ideas out of the party. And some no doubt found Lenin a little harsh. And uh, we Marxists are often accused of being a little harsh and a little hard on alien class ideas. And I've no doubt that many people who try to mix Marxism with postmodernism or, post or, or, or positivism, they're not necessarily conscious reactionaries. And they possibly feel a little hurt being accused of espousing reactionary views. But we should make no mistake, our enemies understand the usefulness of these ideas. Let me quote another scientist and a member of the Nazi party called Pascal Jordan. He described positivism as an antidote to the materialism of the Bolsheviks. And he said, not only is the resultant liquidation of materialism an important enough result, but the positivist conception offers new possibilities of granting living space to religion without contradiction from scientific thoughts. Let us remember that positivism accepts experimental observation and experience as the sole reality for the physicist. The emphasis on this concept leads us to the fact that there are experiences possible quite different from those observations and results. He reported to the Nazis on a positivist conference and he said the following, it seems to be a significant sign of the times that the materialist worldview, viewed as a scientific theory, is being exposed as untenable and contrary to scientific knowledge precisely in those areas of science, which since the Renaissance have been considered its safest domain. These words, I think, are all the more valuable become, because they come from the mouth of an open Nazi. And they confirm precisely what Yola has talked about. The reactionary philosophical trends of the present day have as their goal precisely to restore religion and obscurantism to the place they enjoyed before the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and to launch a counteroffensive against the ideas of that period. Today, it falls to us, the Marxists, to take up the defense of reason, rationality, and materialism against all these trendy trends, trendy trends within philosophy. Thank you for that wonderful contribution, Ben. Up next, we'll have Florian Keller from Austria. Yeah, comrades, the Enlightenment represented an enormous step forward for humanity. As already explained uh, by the comrades, the bourgeoisie took up the ideas of rational and scientific thought as a weapon in its progressive phase. And it cannot let go of this weapon fully even today in its stage of decrepit rot. As production and capitalism has been complicated to such an extent that it is impossible to exist without the systematic application of insights uh, into natural sciences. Uh, but as capitalism has become a factor on the further development of humanity, it is inev inevitable that the weak side, the reactionary side of these ideas is more and more pronounced. The mechanistic, empiricist, isolated side and ideas um, of the Enlightenment. What was reason a few hundred years ago now becomes unreason in the hands of the bourgeoisie. Uh, the most uh, extreme expression of that mechanistic uh, view um, uh, kind of thought was given uh, by the 17th century English chemist Robert Boyle, chemist. <laughs> Uh, he said, following up on the ideas of Hobbes, who came before him, uh, that the universe is like a perfect clockwork. You heard this expression, surely. <laughs> a clockwork which God made in a way that once uh, he started it up, it will run its course perfectly along the lines of divine providence, where everything happening afterwards is determined from the start. And today, scientists will most of the time deny that they would adhere to such an openly religious worldview. But in dismissing dialectical materialism, many will still work with notions derived exactly from this mechanist quasi-religious worldview, uh, be it consciously or unconsciously. And this worldview is still pushed on us through the media and especially the universities and the schools, which, make, which makes it necessary for it to combat, uh, to combat this. There are many aspects where this can be seen. Uh, Yola and other comrades have already explained some of them. I want to concentrate on the question if the universe is finite or infinite and what that means. Because a clockwork-like universe only makes sense if it is finite. Uh, it has to have a definite starting point in time. A clock has to start sometime. And it has to have definite limits in its expanse. Uh, a clock cannot be infinitely large. <laughs> It has to be made up of things that are clearly defined and isolated from each other, different parts. 
and that are only connected through very narrow mechanical one-sided cause and effects with movement not being dynamic but in reality repetitions in an essentially unmoving universe. Uh, Hobbes understood that it would be absurd to accept that there could be something infinite inside the finite universe. So he tried to show that there's no such thing as a real infinity, but only borders of our knowledge. For him, infinity is in essence a human error. But in reality, nothing can be understood without accepting uh, the infinity of being as a whole, as even the development in this period showed. With the development of infinitesimal calculus by Newton and Leibniz, more or less at the same time, which spurred on mathematics. Uh, and as Jola has explained, the findings of Spinoza and later especially Hegel. Uh, Marxism standing on the shoulders of all of these developments shows clearly that the universe is infinite and has no borders. It has no borders in time, space, and matter, which basically in essence are one and the same thing. And that means that conceptions like the beginning of time and matter, like the Big Bang, are clearly idealist and can only lead back to Hobbes and the uh, God as a creator. Even if people like Stephen Hawking tried to mask that with literally literary uh, creations, like uh, he said, uh, the beginning of the universe was a spontaneous creation without a God, whatever that means. <laughs> that does not mean that with the acknowledgement acknowledgement that there exists infinity, uh, we get rid of cr contradictions as Engels explained brilliantly in his book Antidure, uh, which I would recommend to uh, every comrade to study it thoroughly, especially the part on philosophy. We know that development only takes place through contradictions. Uh, one such contradiction is that the, uh, in the universe, on the one hand, everything has a clear causality, uh, and reality is governed by clear laws which arise from this interaction between everything. That means everything is objectively knowable. There is no such thing as something which can't be known any, anywhere. And that everything is a necessity in a philosoph philosophical sense. And yet at the same time, this uh, uh, ca uh, casual casuality causality, sorry, is infinite with uh, reality being an infinitely complex single process where everything is interconnected, which means it is objectively, not only subjectively impossible to know everything, uh, that there is an objective basis for an accident in a philosophical sense. Um, necessity and accident uh, are one of uh, one and the same, uh, two sides of the same coin, basically. As Marxists, we understand that there is no such place to search for the final cause or a world formula that explains everything or anything like that, which uh, many scientists still try to do. Uh, rather, the task is to understand the infinitely complex process that is reality better and better, understand the laws of nature that are an expression of this uh, process and use that knowledge to shape reality. Engels One explained in his brochure, Ludwig Feuerbach and the end of classical German philosophy, uh, the great basic thought that the world is not to be com comprehended as a complex of ready-made things, but a complex of processes in which the things uh, apparently stable, no less than their mind images in our heads. Uh, the concepts go through an uninterrupted change of coming into being and passing away in which in spite of all seeming accidentally, uh, accidentally and of all temporary, temporary retrogression, a progressive development asserts itself in the end. And he goes on to say, this great fundamental thought has, especially since the time of Hegel, so thoroughly permeate, uh, permeated ordinary consciousness that in this generality, it is now scarcely ever contradicted. Uh, in reality, Engels spoke too soon here, as many of these things are constantly contradicted these days. Uh, most importantly, the question of progressive development from the lower to the higher, which the bourgeoisie cannot accept. So to do justice to the weaknesses, uh, not to the weaknesses, but the strengths of the great thinkers of enlightenment, where we need to bring down this capitalist system, which arbitrarily limits the progress once and for all. Thanks for that fascinating contribution, Florian. I will now pass over to Martin Kohler from Switzerland. Thanks, Dylan. 
I'd like to speak about one of the most influential philosophers of the Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant, more specifically, specifically about his failed attempt to solve the contradiction between the two main strands of bourgeois Enlightenment philosophy. On the one hand, you had the position of the empiricists, and empiricism was a weapon against the ideology of the medieval ruling class. Against the dogmas and the idealist approach of the scholastic medieval philosophy, empiricists stressed the need for experiment and knowledge through experience. Locke explained at the end of the 17th century that there are no innate ideas. All knowledge can get into your head or into our head only through our sense experience. It cannot be there before. There can be no so-called a priori ideas or notions that exist in the mind before human sensation and independently of it. Knowledge comes a posteriori, that is after sense experience. And that was an important blow against idealism. And it is the correct starting point for any materialist conception. On the other hand, there were the rationalists for them, reason was the principal means for understanding the world. And the rationalists did have a point. They opposed the narrow focus of the empiricist school by stressing reason and the ability of human thought to generalize. But they started from a, a wrong, an idealist standpoint. And that's why they were ultimately unable to put their conception of human thought on a scientific basis. And both of these main strands of bourgeois philosophy were essentially two inversely one-sided and mutually exclusive polar opposites. Where the empiricists overstressed sense experience, the rationalists idolized pure reason. And for some centuries, bourgeois philosophy navigated in this contradiction, which is impossible to solve without dialectics. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant tried to bring these two sides together and fuse them into a new conception. Kant accepted both the main proposition of the empiricists and of the rationalists. Take causality, for example. Kant was convinced of Hume's argument that it's impossible to perceive causality empirically. From this empiricist standpoint, we can only know what we can perceive. We can see how a tree falls and we can hear a noise when it hits the ground, but we cannot see or hear the causal relation between the two events. Therefore, the ar argument goes, as we cannot perceive causality through our sensual experience, we cannot know causal relations. This is the radical conclusion of the argument of the empiricists showing their weakness or their weak side. But as a true philosopher of enlightenment, Kant was also convinced of the progress of scientific thinking. While he accepted Hume's argument, he couldn't accept his conclusion, which is radically skeptic and hostile to scientific thinking. That's why he tried to rescue causality by reintroducing it through a priori notions and thus falling back into idealism. This sounds very complicated, but what it means is quite simple. Knowledge requires, requires concrete sense experience, the empirical material, but reason then has to bring order into this sense data in order to understand causal relations that cannot be perceived directly. But how can reason establish causality in the sense data in the mind? Kant's answer, if causality cannot be perceived, but apparently can be understood, it must be because general categories and notions like causality already exist in the mind before the sense experience. In other words, you can only know causal relationships between the empirically perceptible objects because the notion of causality already exists in the human mind before sense experience. That is a priori. Nobody can say how these a priori notions get into the minds of the people. They just are there simply because Kant declares them to be universal properties of reason. But again, nobody can, can say where reason came from and how it developed over time. So Kant's attempt to overcome the opposition between empiricism and rationalism isn't the solution at all. 
it leads straight back to the kind of idealism the empiricists rightly tried to overcome. It was the great merit of Kant to have posed the problem, but it's only with dialectics that you can so resolve these fixed polar opposites. And Hegel gave the key for this with his dialectics, but of course Hegel was hindered himself by his own idealism. And it was only really Marx with, as a di dialectical materialist who was able to integrate the true kernel of both the one-sided approaches in a higher and fully materialist and scientific conception. Dialectics brings both sides into flux by seeing them as two sides of what is es essentially a process. Through experience, human gener humans generalize and develop notions and categories. And these categories in turn will help the humans to order new empirical material. It's not necessary to resort to any a priori notions. Notions and theories are, are, which are basic, a basic preconception, uh, precondition for scientific understanding are themselves the product of past collective experiences of mankind. Knowing this today, we could just say that Kant concep Kant's conception is stupid, but Kant, as others of the bourgeois enlightenment, represent a necessary step in the progress towards the scientific conception of dialectical materialism. And we have to acknowledge his part in this. By contrast, what really is stupid and actually a, a scientific crime is to fall back behind Marx and Hegel to Kant's position today. It means falling back into the kind of mysticism that could long be overcome. And if you see how Kant is praised today, this tells you all you need to know about the state of bourgeois society. We have to defend Marxism as a rational and scientific approach against all of the mysticism. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Next, I will bring in Daniel, tuning in from London. Hi, well, we've heard a few comrades mention in passing that today it's fashionable to attack the Enlightenment. A very influential example of this idea comes from the Frankfurt School. Now, the Frankfurt School are most famous for being allegedly Marxists who put forward the idea that it was now impossible for the working class to overthrow capitalism and emancipate humanity. But it is less well known that the foundation, what they base themselves on to conclude that, is a, a thorough attack on the Enlightenment. They say the following. This is a quote from Adorno and Horkheimer, by the way. We have no doubt that freedom in society is inseparable from enlightenment thinking. We believe we have perceived with equal clarity, however, that the very concept of that thinking, the institutions of society with which it is intertwined, already contains the germ of the regression which is taking place everywhere today. Why is this? They also tell us that enlightenment is totalitarian that's a quote and that again i quote enlightenment behaves towards things as a dictator towards men and that the enlightenment is as totalitarian as any system now clearly for them the enlightenment isn't a uh, an intellectual phenomenon of a few hundred years ago instead enlightenment is a thing a sort of spiritual force with miraculous powers by the way this is basically the exact same position that the postmodernists have now clearly this position is a completely idealist and an anti-materialist position this is this is the center of their theories by the way according to their worldview human history is now governed by an all-powerful idea which is the enlightenment which apparently does not express the interests of a definite class that has appeared at a certain point in history with definite interests, but instead it exists on its own account and by virtue of its own characteristics can just regress society as they say it. But the question is, and I think this is the same question you have to ask any idealist, why on earth did this horrible evil idea come to dominate? If it does not simply represent the interests of a class with ma the material interests of, of a real class how and why does this idea come to dominate at that particular point in history 
And this is, this is never answered by any of them. They simply tell us that it's, the enlightenment is an attempt to control and dominate nature and that that for some reason inevitably leads eventually to the attempt to control and dominate other human beings but it's never specified which people are doing the dominating and how they've managed to utilize enlightenment in order to do that it's not even clear if this is supposed to be a class that's using it or some other sort of clique of people what we have is simply abstract man dominating abstract man all things thanks to the miraculous powers of abstract reason or enlightenment and the, the the link between this and their position on on revolution and on on the working class is that in the 20th century society is so scientifically dominated so rationally organized that um inevitably that just means that what we're doing is we're just administering and dominating people we're controlling everyone's lives through scientific thinking and essentially they reduce all of history and all of the problems in history to a psychological profile their, their position is essentially that it is the tendency to to seek scientific answers to things that is in itself it's kind of a drug it's a it, or a disease that is un, you know once you've caught it you can't escape from it and this is, you know, this is not subject to any class's interest. It's simply the ideas itself. It's anybody who is too keen to find an, a definite explanation for any social or any other phenomena. Anybody who does that is trying to control things. And that, that's the problem. And I think you must have come across this yourself when you argue with liberals and people of that, that sort. They always find the fact that we've got answers, the fact that we seem to think that we know or we're trying to explain why there are problems in society, getting to the root of the matter. But that's the problem, you see, you're trying to control things and you're too single-minded. Now, people like that always like to say that the tr trouble with Marxists is they're too single-minded, they're dogmatic, they're closed-minded, essentially. But it's these people who propose to throw out all of the greatest conquests of human thoughts. And just all of it is just essentially so much rubbish. That is arrogant and that is, is narrow-minded. Instead, of course, we must uh, base ourselves, it's, it's vital that Marxists, that revolutionaries, base themselves on the best aspects of the Enlightenment. In particular, it's bold materialism, it's clarity of thought, and it's honesty, it's intellectual honesty, which I think is what the Enlightenment really is, is characterized by. That is the only, with, it is only with that attitude and with those ideas that humanity can be liberated. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel, and all those who contributed to that fantastic discussion. Now, before I hand back to Yola to sum up, it is clear that the ideas of this period were a crucial weapon for the bourgeoisie as they waged a war against the feudal order. For revolutionaries today, Marxism is our most powerful weapon, which arms us in our war against the capitalist order. But unfortunately, wars are quite expensive, as the imperialists are now finding out. And in the words of the Roman politician Cicero, it is finances that are the sinews of war. So with that, I ask that if you've been inspired by this talk and this event, then please keep donating to our financial collection for a new office and help fund the war against capitalism. Visit donate.marxist.com to do so. I will now hand back to Yola to sum up the discussion. Uh, yes, thank you, comrades. I think it was really an excellent discussion. And all the contribution, uh, contributions helped to shine light on different aspects of, of this topic. Hamid and Martin both, both went into more depth about the revolutionary development of thought uh, during the Enlightenment period. And we've seen uh, uh, also from what uh, Flo uh, showed that these questions they discussed are still relevant today. And if you're interested to get into the specific topic uh, of the ideas of enlightenment, there are some very good, uh, interesting Marxist reads about it. Uh, firstly, Friedrich Engels, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, including the excellent introduction to the English edition of this brochure. Also by Engels, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of Classical German Philosophy. Uh, Plechanov's uh, The Development of the Monist View of History, as well as um, Essays on the History of Materialism. And of course, our uh, new publication, uh, The History of Philosophy, Philosophy and Marxist Perspectives by Alan Woods. 
And I must also say it's not scary at all to read the original philosophers of that, of that time um, at all. <laughs> I'm personally a fan of the philosophical writings of the French materialist Denis Diderot, which are very humoristic and, and lighthearted. And Engels mentions that in some of uh, his writings, Diderot manages to give quite a dialectical view on, on certain topics. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, the time to fangirl here now. <laughs> Uh, what I want to emphasize is really is that a historical view of the development of ideas is extremely important. It's very easy from today's point of view to dismiss these thoughts as old and outdated. But first of all, it's very childish to apply today's knowledge on past ideas and say that they were wrong. And this attitude comes from the completely idealistic notion that every progressive thought in history was just a, a stroke of genius out of nowhere. Uh, and if it, if, if it wasn't discovered earlier, well, then there wasn't a smart enough person to discover it uh, at that time yet. So. But there is a historical uh, process to the development of ideas. And this, this attitude, this is this attitude I described, it's uh, the attitude of the so-called philosophers of today who think that they are just the biggest geniuses of all, having discovered the best thoughts ever. When actually they don't even notice or pretend not to notice that all their ideas are just a bad recycling of old ideas. As Lenin once said about the idealists of his day, this is all the same old trash with a slightly refurbished or repainted signboard. But even though there's this condescending attitude towards the ideas of the Enlightenment today, these allegedly outdated ideas are in many cases still the dominant ideas even today. But, but not the progressive and useful side. Um, these sides were incorporated in, into and developed by Marxism. But they're weak sides that are then exaggerated and turned uh, into completely reactionary ideas. And I think this was, this was very well put by the contributions of, of Ben and Flo and, and also Daniel. The postmodernist ideas uh, reject the Enlightenment and believe that their view are, views are the most profound denial of truth and objective reality. And the positivists and contemporary empiricists see themselves as the successors of the old empiricists, but both end up in the same reactionary dead end of subjective idealism. Both reject or at least doubt, severely doubt uh, objective reality. Both deny that truth can be known, and both reject Marxism, even if they pretend sometimes that they don't. But there is this ideas in universities and also within the so-called left, that if old philosophers were a bit one-sided or exaggerated um, or wrong, this must also be the case for Marxist philosophy, right? That there are weaknesses in Marxism, or maybe that Marxism is just the best that we have now, but there's certain room for, for enhancement and improvement. But the people who believe that they can enhance Marxism always end up completely butchering the fundamentals of Marxism. And there's a reason why that is so, apart from uh, the bourgeois interests that often influence them. <laughs> the, those who want to update Marxism have a wrong conception of what Marxism is. They see it as a closed system, a dogmatic accumulation of phrases. And I mean, this is the way that many philosophers, uh, philosophers uh, operated in the past. Where they created perfect closed uh, systems and declared their system was the best, the last one, the final truth. Even Hegel himself also did this, even though his method, the dialectical method, actually is in contradiction to exactly such a system. Uh, but the point is Marxism is not a closed uh, set of dogmas and phrases that can be just repeated. It's first of all a method, a dialectical, materialist, and historical method. And this is why Marx and Engels were of the opinion that philosophy ends with, uh, with this uh, method. That does not mean at all that from now on there can never be new uh, discoveries or ideas. That would be absurd because the world is constantly changing and there are infinitely many things that we do not know yet. But what they mean is precisely that we reach a, reach a point where we don't need to create big philosophical systems anymore uh, to bring human knowledge uh, further ahead. But we need to apply the essence of philosophical thoughts, the method, to nature and to reality and to deepen our understanding of the real world through practice. Uh, as a philosophical method, Marxism is about understanding change and thus influencing and controlling change. Or in the words of Karl Marx in his thesis on uh, Feuerbach, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So it's about understanding the laws of, of development, looking to find the concrete inherent contradictions in any given phenomenon in order to find what the essence of this phenomenon is. Uh, this is the method that Marx used to analyze capitalism. But have there been no new insights gained by Marxists since the death of Marx? Of course there have been. There have been many valuable experiences and contributions by Marxists such as Lenin, Trotsky, or Ted Graham, precisely because they used the method of Marxism. 
For example, Trotsky's analysis of the Soviet Union and of the degenerated worker states. This was a new, a completely new phenomenon in history. Nothing like it had existed before. And actually, there are a lot of philosophical insights from reading the brilliant works of Trotsky, such as Revolution Betrayed or the History of the Russian Revolution. Uh, but those people who claim that Marxism is unfinished and needs enhancement have not understood and stood at all what Marxism actually is. They treat Marxism as sort of a perfect system that they want to approve, but only end up in idealistic distortions and, and rubbish. With Marxism, philosophy has become a conscious tool that understands the connection between our ideas and our material surroundings. And this is especially important for the task of socialist revolution. An important difference between the bourgeois revolutions and the socialist revolution is precisely that it, the socialist revolution is, is a conscious um, act. The capitalists as a ruling class act more or less blindly and, and individually, each of them in competition with the other as owners of private property. But what is the task of the proletariat, of the working class? The strength of the proletariat lies in the fact that it does not own property, but all the workers in the world produce uh, the wealth there is. They do not own the factories and the land and so on. That, that means that the proletariat needs to cooperate and consciously expropriate the bourgeoisie. And as I said, this is a very conscious act um, compared to, to bourgeois revolutions. The Reformation, as well as the English Revolution, were fought in the name of religion. The French Revolution was fought in the name of reason. But the Russian Revolution won because the Bolsheviks had a conscious understanding of the task that needed to be done. They, their ideas were not a guise or an ideological veil. Their ideas were scientific insights in society, a scientific understanding of socialism. They, they had Marxism. Uh, this is why uh, to us as the INT, theory is, uh, is so important. Uh, so let's arm ourselves with the ideas of Marxism in order to overthrow capitalism.